Hey everybody, welcome back. We're so glad you could join us for another week of Grace City Church Online. We have a few announcements for you before we get started. Our first announcement is for our parents. We actually filmed some more kids' videos yesterday and we're so excited to share those with you guys. We wanted to encourage you to share these with other parents in your network that you might think would love these resources and materials. You can find these videos on our website at gracecityboston.com forward slash kids. Second, because of your faithful giving, we were able to donate $1,000 to the Boys and Girls Club in Dorchester. If you're interested in becoming a part of giving to, back to our community, you can do that at our website, gracecityboston.com forward slash giving. Lastly, we know these times can be lonely and isolating. And so we wanted to remind you of another resource we have for community right now, and that's House Church. And we're still meeting online virtually through Zoom. And if you're interested in how to join a house church, you can find more information on how to do that at gracecityboston.com forward slash house church. Now we're going to move into a time of worship.
much for joining us in our time of worship. Now we're going to move into a time of prayer. This past Thursday, our prayer topic for the week was racial justice and peace, and we're going to continue praying for that right now. Father God, we come to you as the ultimate judge the ultimate giver of justice and lover of justice, God. We pray for our nation in this time, Lord. Father, we ask that through protests, voices would be heard, God, and you would bring an end to the racism in our country. Father, we pray for radical justice for your people in the United States, God. Father, we pray for your church nationally and globally. Father, would you teach us how to listen God, teach us how to lament during this time. Would your church be a picture of your love for all your people, God? Jesus, would you teach us how to be wise and discerning and how to stand up for those around us, God, our brothers and our sisters, Lord. Father, bring peace to our nation. God, bring peace to our hearts. Bring peace to our communities, Lord. We love you, God. Thank you for hearing our cries, God. Thank you for being a God who loves justice, God, the most just judge, Lord. We love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Everybody. Welcome back to Grace City Church Online. My name is Cohen Brown. I'm the college lead here at Grace City. I'm going to be giving you a message today while Brian is out this week with his family. I want to start off by asking you a question. Have you ever been so far from home, maybe at a summer camp or when you moved to college or moved to a new city? Have you ever been so far from home that you start to realize I don't really know who I am. This is the first time I've been like on my own, away from my family, away from what I know. And I'm starting to realize that uh, I don't really know what I value. I don't really know uh, what I'm like, what I'm here for, what I'm doing, what is my purpose here uh, in this place, what am I living for, things like that. Um, I was going through a very similar thing when I first went to college, and uh, I, I had this longing, like all f my freshman year of college, to, to go back home every single weekend. And so I kind of limited myself uh, once a month when I was in college to go back home and I would really, really miss my family or my friends or something like that. And I learned that after a couple hours of being home, suddenly I wanted to be back at school again. Uh, it, it was this weird like feeling of like never being uh, just comfortable or, or at peace where, where I 
where I was. And then I would get back to school and I would miss home again. And now that I'm graduated and I live in Boston, the feeling is the same, but now I miss college. And so when I leave Boston to go back home, then I miss Boston again. And so I, I'm always in this state of like, the grass is always greener on the other side. Like I, I'm not home, where is home? Uh, you know, and, and it's kind of weird because it's like, I live here in Boston, my family is back home in Tennessee, but no matter if I'm here or there, there's always this desire to get back home. And so that's, that's what I was thinking of when I was reading the book of Daniel, which is what we're going to be talking about today, is how there's this longing in all of us to get back home. And no matter where we are, what season we're in, what scenario we're in, there's always this longing in us to get back home. So today we're going to be looking at the story of Daniel and his friends and how they are taken from their home in Jerusalem to live their entire lives, basically, in what we call the exile. So if you've been with us through this meta narrative series, uh, previously when Brian was uh, preaching last week, uh, we looked at Israel's continued disobedience and idolatry in the promised land, in the land that God had given them. And so we're going to, to start off kind of setting the scene tonight by uh, looking at Jeremiah chapter 25. So that's a really long chapter, and the whole chapter is pretty much a prophecy of what God is about to take Israel through. So I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but if you have your Bible with you, you can open it up to Jeremiah 25. Uh, and pretty much the, the, the main points of this really long prophecy that the prophet Jeremiah gives is that one, Israel have not listened to God's prophets and they haven't turned from following the ways of the world. And because of that, God is going to send the king of Babylon to lay siege to Jerusalem, destroy everything, and take them slave into Babylon, okay? And he says that Israel is going to serve Babylon for 70 years, exactly. And then at the end of that 70 years, God is going to punish Babylon for their wickedness, okay? So before we get into the book of Daniel and the story of Daniel, I just wanted to set that scene. And we see that that uh, is historically documented in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 36, this, uh, this period of Israel being taken into the exile. So let's read that here before we get into Daniel. 2 Chronicles chapter 36, starting in verse 15. But the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word against them by the hand of his messengers or prophets, sending them time and time again, for he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept ridiculing God's messengers or prophets, despising his words and scoffing at the prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. So he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, or Babylonians, who killed their young fit men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no pity on young men or young women, elderly or aged. He handed them all over to him. He took everything to Babylon, all the articles of God's temple, large and small, the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the king and his officials. Then the Chaldeans burned God's temple. They tore down Jerusalem's wall, burned all of its palaces, and destroyed all of its valuable articles. He deported those who escaped from the sword to Babylon, and they became servants to him and his sons until the rise of the Persian kingdom. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through Jeremiah and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of it, the desolation until 70 years were fulfilled. Okay, so just setting the scene, we have this insane prophecy by Jeremiah pinpointing all these specific facts about what God is going to do because of Israel's disobedience, what he's going to take them through. And so if we're putting ourselves in the position of an Israelite during this time, you probably have a bunch of people freaking out, uh, and probably thinking a bunch of different things. First of all, they're probably thinking, oh my gosh, 70 years, you know, that's my entire life. I'm not going to get out of this alive. I'll be lucky to come die in my homeland when I'm like 100 years old. Uh, you know, or they're probably thinking my whole life is going to be wasted as a slave if I'm not killed right here, right when they get here. You know, a lot of them are probably thinking, I guess I'll just become a Babylonian. You know, I'll just give up my, my Israeliteness, my being a, a person of God, and I'll just become a Babylonian. My whole life is there anyway. Uh, so that's what the majority of Israel does when they get taken into exile. So now let's look at the specific life of Daniel and his friends. Uh, Daniel is a very interesting character, and his friends, they all 
kind of band together uh, and they have similar gifts, similar uh, sort of talents that God has given them and they have a very interesting role to play during this period of exile. So before we get into Daniel chapter one, let me say a prayer uh, and just bless the word of God here. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophecies of Jeremiah, for the documentation of the fulfillment of those prophecies that we see in 2 Chronicles. We thank you for uh, the story of Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that show us great faith during exile. And they all point us to your sovereignty and your providence over all the things that go on in this, in this crazy, broken world. Would you use this scripture to change our hearts and to to acknowledge your sovereignty, and to grow in our trust and our faith in you. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what this word has for us today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to be reading a lot of scripture today. It's kind of like story time, uh, so I hope you have your Bibles out and you're ready to engage. So starting in, in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah... King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledge, perceptive and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them from the Judites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave them the names Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank, so he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink and then deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, he looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them. And among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, so really long introduction there. What all happens in this first part of the story and what all does it mean? Well, we see from the beginning that Daniel is a really young guy. He's in his mid-teens right now. He's royal. He's educated. He comes from a very privileged background. He's kind of grown up in this bubble, okay? He's, he's seen as valuable enough by the Babylonians that they don't want to kill him. They want to use them to basically reprogram him to serve the Babylonian kingdom because he's smart and he's wise and he's got gifts, giftings and talents and whatnot. But we see that Daniel is a man who's full of conviction, okay? Uh, you may ask, well, why does he want to not eat the king's food and drink the king's wine if that's what the king is giving him? Isn't that like the best food and wine you could drink? What is, so, so what's the big deal about that? Well, there's probably three different reasons. One, uh, there's dietary laws that the Jews are commanded to follow in the law. So maybe Daniel uh, is following those. We don't know exactly what the food is, but maybe eating those foods would break those laws and he wants to follow God instead. Maybe the food and the wine was sacrificed to a false Babylonian God and he doesn't want to eat or drink them because of that reason. 
Maybe also he's trying to associate himself with the rest of the Israelites who have been enslaved by Babylon. This is the most likely of all the three reasons. He knows that he's kind of been given this privilege because of his upbringing. He knows that he's only being served this food because he has certain gifts and talents because of his education that he can serve Babylon. All his brothers and sisters and and neighbors and everything who survived are probably slaves in Babylon right now. So he's associating with those who are oppressed. We see that he's a man of conviction and he's a man of great character a teenager really of great character so why does he have this conviction why is this conviction worth anything right now well like I said the Babylonians are reprogramming all of the Israelites that they took slave they see value in them so that they can add them to their own kingdom so Daniel is is starting this this series of resistances against Babylonian reprogramming. He doesn't want to rely on the king's food, the king's drink. He doesn't want to become a Babylonian at heart. He wants to uh, do well in his job, but he doesn't want to change his identity and become reprogrammed to be a Babylonian, okay? And so we see the last verse here in verse 21. It says that Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus comes decades and decades later. He's actually a Persian king who takes over Babylon. So we see that Daniel is going to be in Babylon for this entire exile. So uh, we have some foreshadowing there that Daniel Daniel's going to have a, a big role to play in the exile like, it, uh, like this. So why... Why is Daniel like this? Why does Daniel have these convictions? What is he holding on to? Well, it, for, for the answer there, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 29. So if you remember the prophecy in Jeremiah 25, Daniel knows that prophecy. He's holding on to that prophecy. He's holding on to a lot of things that the prophet Jeremiah has said, and this is one of them. So Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4 through 7. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourself and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it thrives, you will thrive. Because this is an extremely important command for all the Israelites living in exile. This is basically the mindset that God is commanding them to have. So Daniel knows he's supposed to seek the good of the kingdom of Babylon without completely giving over his identity to them, okay? Because when Babylon thrives, he will thrive, okay? So if we're thinking about the prophecy that they're going to be in exile for 70 years, and we're thinking about this command to basically stitch your life there in Babylon, build houses, build your life, have kids, you know, just live like you would normally just in Babylon. There's some interesting observations that we can make here. First of all, God, this may seem like very harsh, but God never once says that he's abandoning Israel. He's simply saying, I'm going to put you through this exile. So yeah, he's disciplining Israel. He's punishing them, but only so that he can save them out 70 years later. What's going on here is that he's refining his people. He's putting them through great hardship to sort of shave off the excess and get all of the the lukewarm, wishy-washy people of Israel to just leave, basically. The ones who don't really love God are just going to become Babylonians, and the ones who are faithful are going to remember the promise and go back to the promised land. So first observation to be made here, God is refining his people through the exile. He has a sovereign purpose through the exile. Second thing that we want to acknowledge here is that God is sending them on mission to Babylon. What do I mean by that? Well, God is not just punishing or disciplining his people. He also loves Babylon. He loves all people, and he's sending his people into Babylon so that they can help the city thrive and be a witness to Yahweh's great power. So those are the two themes that I want us to to think about as we look through these couple stories in Daniel, okay? So let's look first at Daniel chapter 3. So we're going to look at Daniel and his friend's faithfulness at the beginning of the exile and at the end of exile. So first at the beginning, 
So at this point, Daniel has been promoted to a high position in the government. If we read Daniel 1 and 2, we see that he's very good at interpreting dreams, and King Nebuchadnezzar is really loving all the stuff that Daniel is doing for him. He's interpreting his dreams. He's not just interpreting them. He's telling them what his dreams are before Nebuchadnezzar even tells them, and then interpreting them correctly. He's doing good work. He's representing God well. But Nebuchadnezzar uh, has kind of gotten a big head from this dream that Daniel interpreted. Daniel interpreted this dream for him, basically telling him that God is going to bring judgment on his empire and his empire is going to fall. Okay, but in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar was represented by a gold statue head. So Nebuchadnezzar kind of takes this and, and he kind of uh, gets, it swells his ego and his pride and he ends up making a full gold statue and commanding all of Babylon to bow down and worship it. Okay, so um, in this story, Daniel and his friends end up not bowing down to this idol. Remember, they're men of conviction. And Nebuchadnezzar is extremely angry, obviously, and he wants to sentence them to death for not bowing down to this idol. So let's read what happens here. Let's le- read how they respond. And let's read and sort of understand what is, what is their character uh, behind saying no to worshiping this idol. Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 13. Then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zyre, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. But if you don't worship it, you will be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? So just pause right there. It's very ironic that Nebuchadnezzar is asking this because just before this, uh, Daniel had interpreted his dream so correctly that Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged Daniel's God and said that he is Lord of all. But he's quickly forgotten this. And Daniel and his friends have to uh, have to keep going in their faithfulness and, and, uh, and reject what Nebuchadnezzar is telling them to do here. So let's continue in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. Verse 18, but even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. Okay, so let's focus in on verse 18 right right there. Let's, Let's read that again. He says, they say, even if God does not rescue us from the burning fire, we want you as kings to know that we not, we're not going to serve your gods. It shows us their, their trust in the Lord and their faith in the Lord and their deep conviction that it doesn't matter what current circumstances they're going through. It doesn't matter what physical torture you want to bring on us. It's not about that. It's not about my immediate circumstances. It's not even about my earthly life. I know where my eternity stands. I know what the God that I serve, and you can't change that, Nebuchadnezzar. So it's this very blatant statement that shows their conviction and their godly character, okay? So what happens as a result of this? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar increases the furnace, uh, multiplies the heat by seven times, uh, and then orders them to be thrown into the furnace. And it's so hot that the people who throw them into the furnace end up getting burned alive, okay? But we see God at work. Of course, God saves them out of that. So let's read starting in verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and called Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. When the satraps, prefects, governors, and king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair on their heads was singed, their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. 
Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Okay, so what is the point of God's deliverance in this purpose? You may be saying, okay, that's great, but no one's threatening to throw me into a furnace. No one's threatening to kill me. What am I supposed to take from this story? Well, it's the same thing that they took. So remember, they they said straight uh, to Nebuchadnezzar's face, it doesn't matter if God saves us out of this fire or not. That's not the point. The point is that we will never bow to your God. Where There are certain lines we will not cross. So it's just enforcing that it's, it's not necessarily about God saving them. It's about their conviction and their trust in the Lord. Okay, Daniel's friends, they're not, they're not in this for a promotion. They're not in this for some land or a nice place to live in Babylon. If they were, they probably just would have bowed down to the idol, okay? They're, in, they're simply living out that calling from Jeremiah 29 to seek the good of the city, to do well at their job without holding... Uh, without uh, giving up their conviction, without compromising their faith in the one true God. And they do this so much so that the Son of God himself makes an appearance in the furnace next to them to affirm their faithfulness. The fourth person in the fire is none other than the Son of God, Jesus himself. Okay, so this is a great example of at the beginning of their lives, Daniel and, and his friends, they both show great conviction, great character, and great resolve to follow God no matter what the circumstances are. Okay, so what about, what about the end of Daniel's life? Okay, what, what about the end? So we know that he spends this entire exile in Babylon. We, we've seen that already. Uh, but is he still as faithful at the end as he was at the beginning? Well, if, if I were to ask you if you know who Daniel is in the Bible, you would probably say, yeah, Daniel is the guy in the lion's den, right? Yeah, and that's exactly right. Maybe uh, you don't know Daniel when he's in the lion's den. He's actually in his 80s. That story is only three chapters lady, later, but he's, he's at the end of his life, okay? And not only is he at the end of his life, he's on his third king, but his second empire. So at this point, Daniel has faithfully served King Nebuchadnezzar King Nebuchadnezzar's son, but now this third king that he's under, uh, the Medes and the Persians have actually taken over. They're in the process of taking over the empire. So now all the reputation that Daniel has built up by being such a good worker has now basically been thrown out of the window. The Persians don't trust him. They don't know who he is. They just know uh, he's an old dude who serves one God, and he, he's a man of great conviction, okay? And all these Persians who come in to do the same sort of job Daniel does, they don't really like Daniel because he's really good at his job, okay? He's a very faithful uh, advisor to the king. He's a good counselor, uh, and he can interpret dreams just like, in, you know, uh, as, as well as anyone else can, okay? So we know that that's, a, that's the story of the lion's den. So, so let's, let's read that scripture now, and let's get a, a further into... Um, seeing how Daniel was acting basically in his 80s compared to in his teens. Okay, starting in in Daniel chapter 6, verse number 4. The administrators and satraps therefore kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, but they could find no charge or corruption, for he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Then these men said, we will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. So the administrators and satraps went together to the king and said to him, may King Darius live forever. This is the Persian king, King Darius. All the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, establish the edict and sign the document so that as the law of the Medes and the Persians, it is irrevocable and cannot be changed. So King Darius signed the written edict. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, what's the first thing that he does? It says, he went into his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened towards Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring 
his God. So just like at the beginning of his exile, okay, he loves the city well. He does his job so well that all the other workers of the, of the nation that he's in are jealous of him. They don't like him because he does his job so well and with such integrity. Okay, but there's just some things Daniel won't do. Seeking the good of the city doesn't mean doing all that the city tells him to do. It means loving the city in the way that God has commanded him to love the city, okay? And let's remember, the edict, the edict was only for a month. It was only 30 days, okay? But Daniel considered 30 days without prayer worse than death, worse than getting thrown into the lion's den, okay? Uh, so they knew what Daniel was about, and they attacked that. But that doesn't change what Daniel lived for. It, doesn't, it didn't change what Daniel did at all. He could, have, he could have hid his prayer. He could have closed his window. He could have done it in silence, you know, and, and they wouldn't have really known any better. But that's not the point, okay? If he were to do that, it would miss the entire point. Remember, God has sent them into Babylon to live on mission. So if he were to do that, it would completely miss the point that he's on mission in Babylon to love the city well, okay? Sinclair Ferguson says this about Daniel's prayer here. He says, Whenever Daniel prayed, he instinctively knelt in the direction of Jerusalem. His mind, his emotions, and his will were focused on the power and the promises of God that were symbolized by that city. It was an attempt on Daniel's part to focus his attention on God's covenant word, which is the foundation of all true prayer. It reminded him that he was a stranger and an exile in Babylon. His citizenship and his loyalties lay elsewhere. Jerusalem was a reminder of that covenant word. So we see what was most important to Daniel. It wasn't keeping his life. It wasn't avoiding you know, struggle and trial. It was simply that relationship with God. He, he didn't want to sever that connection even for just 30 days to save his life. He didn't even want to hide his prayers when he probably could have gotten away with it, okay? But what promises is he holding to exactly? What promises, as that Sinclair Ferguson quote told us, what, what promises, what covenant is he holding to exactly? Well, it's the promise of the Messiah. So after, uh, after we see that God makes a covenant with Daniel, that he's going to bring a Messiah through his lineage that will establish an eternal kingdom, we see that after that point in the Old Testament, all of the faithful Israelites, what are they doing? What's their, what's their common faith? Their trust that God is going to provide a Messiah to establish an eternal kingdom and return them home. So once again, let's go back to the prophet Jeremiah. This is the prophet that Daniel is clinging to at this, at this point. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 23, starting in verse 5. Jeremiah says, Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will raise up a righteous branch for David, he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. This is the name he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the land of the north and from all the other countries where I had banished them, they will dwell once more in their own land. So that's the promise that Daniel is holding to. Not just the promise that they're going to be saved out of this land at the end of 70 years, which is coming pretty quickly, but it's that God is going to bring a Messiah through the line of David who will establish an eternal kingdom, okay? So what is the result of Daniel's prayers? Obviously, those men, they come and they seize Daniel and they tell him, you know, you're going to be thrown into the lion's den now. And the king affirms that. And this is a story that a lot of us probably know. And if, if you don't know, it's very quickly summarized. The king throws Daniel into the lion's den uh, as a punishment. And then God shuts the mouths of the lions and saves Daniel uh, from uh, being eaten by the lions. They go and open up the lion's den much later, and they see that Daniel's just there, and he's just been praying this whole time, okay? So let's see how the king, now the, the king of Babylon, the Persian king Darius, how he responds, and it's very similar to how King Nebuchadnezzar responded during the story about the furnace. So in Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 25, the king Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. That's the first thing he says in response to Daniel's salvation out of the lion's den from God. This is his first time witnessing this. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar realized this. The second king realized this. And now it's his turn. 
Continuing on in verse 26. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. For he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Okay, uh, we see here Daniel's been talking a lot about this eternal kingdom. So much so that that's what King Darius is saying now. He says, he's the living God who endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Where's that coming from? Daniel is telling him, I believe in God. Like, I believe specifically in my God, in Yahweh, because he's, he's provided before and his eternal kingdom is coming. You can hear that he's been talking to Darius about this. John Piper famously says that missions exist because worship does not. I think that's a great way to, to summarize why we have missionaries, why we have mission trips, why we plant churches. It's not for our own glory. It's not just to have more numbers everywhere. It's because God is owed worship from those who are not worshiping him. And Daniel knows this, and he's living this out. Daniel's conviction and faithfulness to God's mission gave the space for all the Babylonian kings to see Yahweh at his saving work. And it results in the king giving God the glory that he deserves. We see this wonderful story of Daniel's faithfulness resulting in people who are far from God seeing God's saving work and giving him the glory that he deserves. So we've seen Daniel and his friends at the beginning of the exile, and we've seen Daniel at the end of the exile. So what principles are we supposed to take from this? Well, the main principle here is that the way of exile, the way of loving the, the city you're in, the people around you, not for your own benefit, okay, but to, to point them towards God and to give them a reason to glorify God, okay? This way of exile is the way of Jesus. It's not an Old Testament thought alone, this is the entire Bible, okay? The entire Bible is teaching us how to live in exile, okay? And how we, how we see the gospel through this is, is Christ himself exiled himself from heaven to bring us out of exile in this broken world here uh, on the earth. So, so where do we get this idea carried on in the New Testament? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 11, Peter speaks of Christians as living in exile. So we go from an Old Testament to a New, te- New Testament perspective here. Let's read what Peter has to say here in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 11. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day that he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governor as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. So you see this this vocab that is using exiles, strangers, a royal nation, priesthood, sojourners in a foreign land. This idea that God's people are in exile is continued right on through the New Testament, except in, in the Old Testament, God took his people into exile so that he could save them out of it. Uh, from, from, for us in a New Testament perspective as Christians, Christians are built in exile. It, it's, it's, it's biblical to see the world as a foreign land. It's, it's not our home. It was, but our sin has broken the world. And this is not our home. We have an, inter- we have an eternal inheritance that we are looking forward to. That's our hope. And that is our heart. And that is how we, that, that affects how we live today. It's the same exact thing as Daniel. The same principle is carried forward through the entire Bible. So what do we do with this? Well, I've got, I've got three different kinds of applications that we can take from here. First is a call to action, okay? So most likely nobody's calling you to, to bow down to a cold statue. No one's calling you to interpret their dreams. No one's calling you to give up prayer at all, okay? Um, but today in 2020, there are other things that could keep us from following God in our day-to-day lives, okay? There, there's much less of a pressure to to uh, denounce our faith in one swift action, but there's much more just small, slow and steady pressure that 
basically tries to get us to slowly drift away from being people of God and drift into being people of the world, okay? And if we're not disciplined and we don't build conviction like Daniel did, our spiritual muscles will sort of atrophy. And before we know it, we've just drifted in to being like the world, okay? So maybe, maybe uh, if you're a, a working professional in Boston, maybe an application here is, man, I've been working seven days a week for my boss and uh, it's not biblical for me to just work like this. I need a Sabbath. I need a day of rest. Jesus commands this. Jesus created me to rest every seven days. Okay, so I can rest in him and find joy in him. Maybe I just need to tell my boss, hey, this, this work schedule, it's just, I can't do it anymore. It's, it's not that I can't, I can't do it. It's that I don't want to do it. I, I can't do it because I can't serve God well while working seven days a week. So, so maybe it's having that conversation with, with your boss and saying, look, I want to work so well for you five days a week, maybe six days a week, uh, that you don't call me at all on a Sunday or a Saturday or something like that. Maybe, maybe we develop that conviction to where we want to display a lifestyle uh, that gets people thinking, man, why do they care so much about being faithful to God's commands? Uh, I want to know more about that, you know. Maybe our friends are, or the people that were around at work are, are, are maybe pulling us into um, some slander or some gossip, and it's sort of like, you don't think it's that bad, but before you realize that you've been gossiping more and more for the last year, two years, something like that, and you've drifted into worldliness. And maybe right now you just need to to speak up next time you're, uh, those people you're around are, are speaking like that and say, guys, I, I can't participate in this. It may sound like I'm a goody two-shoes or like I'm just trying to be, you know, holier than thou or something, but I just don't want to become a person that gossips and slanders this much. I just don't think it does any good. You know, these are the applications that we need to be focusing on right now. There's a call to action here to live uh, like, just like Daniel did in exile, okay? So one, there's a call to action. Two, uh, there's a call to proper theology here. Uh, we have to acknowledge that the exile was not just Babylon's work. It wasn't just Babylon that decided to do this. The exile was God's doing, not Babylon's. He used Babylon's. He used the Babylonians to do his work, okay? So we need to acknowledge God's sovereignty uh, through exile, Okay, Christians have been exiled since the beginning. Okay, in Israel, like we said, God moved His people in exile to bring them out of it. Okay, He was sovereign over the entire thing. Okay, and now as us as Christians, we've been saved out of exile, and we are on our way back home. And God is sovereign over all the ups and downs through that. So we need to understand this is just one of the many stories that teach us of God's sovereignty and how that plays a huge role in us trusting God. It's hard to trust Him if we really don't think He's sovereign over all things. And then I just want to encourage you guys, just remember Daniel and his friends, they were really young when they got uh, to Babylon, when they were exiled. But the point wasn't that they were young. The point was that they were ready when exile came. Okay? He knew what God commanded because he was in the word regularly. He understood God's command. He had it hidden in his heart. He was obeying God's commands. Okay? He expected persecution. He expected trials. He expected for his faith to be compromised. He expected for people to push him out of godliness in the small stuff and the big stuff, in the food and drink that he ate and in the calls to just denounce your God and stop praying. The big things and the small things, he was ready and he expected it. So uh, if, you, if you wait until the trials come to sort of build that discipline, build that conviction, it's probably going to be too late to try to fight those things. So this is a call now and an encouragement now that you're never too young, you're never too old, you're never too not in a certain season to really build conviction and discipline and understanding of the word of God. Because as Christians, we're living in exile today. The whole world is our Babylon, especially in America with all the things going on today. You have all these different viewpoints, all these different things pulling our hearts, pulling our, our worship to all these worldly things. I just want to encourage you that it, it's never too late to start building that conviction, building that discipline. Daniel gives us a great example of this. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We thank you for your faithfulness and your sovereignty through times like exile. I pray that you would, under, uh, you would help us to understand uh, your plan and your sovereignty as we live this life entirely in exile. We're not just in exile for 70 years. We're in exile for as long as you have us on this earth. And we live in the hope 
that one day when you come back or when we leave this earth, we will enter into that eternal kingdom that you promised uh, through David, through Jeremiah, through Daniel, through all your prophets, and most certainly through your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us for another week online. Just a reminder, if you need prayer, you can hit the live prayer button below. If you can wait a few days for a response, you can fill out an info card on our website and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Have a great week, guys.